Chapter Forty of Delorme by G. P. R. James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Forty. I was standing at the window of my bedchamber in one of those meditative, almost sad moods, which often fill up the pauses of more active and energetic being when the mind falls back upon itself after the stir and bustle of great enterprises and the silent moral voice within seems to rebuke us for the worm-like pettiness of our earthly struggles and the vain futility of all our mortal endeavours nothing could be more lovely than the scene from the window the sun was setting over the dark forest of arden which skirting all round the northern limits of the view formed a dark purple girdle to the beautiful principality of sudan but day had only yet so far declined as to give a rich and golden splendour to the whole atmosphere and his beams still flashed against every point of the landscape where any bright object met them as if they encountered a living diamond running from the south-east to the north were the heights of amblemont and the soft green summit of which stretching up to the zenith the whole sky was mottled with a flight of light high clouds which caught every beam of the sinking sun and blushed brighter and brighter as he descended a thousand villages and hamlets with their little spires and now and then the turrets of the chateaux scattered through the valley peeped out from every clump of trees the flocks of sheep and the herds of cattle winding along towards their folds gave an air of peaceful abundance to the scene the grand meurs wandering through its rich meadows with a thousand meanders and glowing brightly in the evening light added something both solemn and majestic to the whole i was watching the progress of a boat gliding silently along the stream whose calm waters it scarcely seemed to ruffle in its course and while passion and ambition and pride and vanity and the thousand of irritable feelings that struggled in my bosom during the day were lulled into tranquillity by the influence of the soft peaceful scene before my eyes i was thinking how happy it would be to glide through life like that little bark with a full sail and a smooth and golden tide till the stream of existence fell into the dark ocean of eternity when my dream was broken by some one knocking at my chamber door though i wished them no good for their interruption i bade them came in and the moment after the duke of bouillon himself stood before me monsieur de Lorme, said he advancing and doffing his hat i hope i do not interrupt your contemplations i bowed and begged him to be seated and after a moment or two he proceeded i am happy in finding you alone for though certainly one is bound to do whatever one conceives right before the whole world should chance order it so yet of course when one has to acknowledge oneself in the wrong it is more pleasant to do so in private especially he added with a smile for a sovereign prince in his own castle i was this morning monsieur de Lorme, both rude and unjust towards you and i have come to ask your pardon frankly do you give it me although i believe there was at least as much policy as candour in the conduct of the duke i did not suffer that conviction to affect my behaviour towards him and i replied had i preserved any irritation my lord from this morning the condescension and frankness of your present apology would of course have obliterated it at once i thought i saw a slight colour mount in the duke's cheek at the word apology for men will do a thousand things which they do not like to hear qualified by even the mildest word that can express them and i easily conceived that though the proud lord of sedan had for his own purposes fully justified me in the use of the term it hurt his ears to hear that he had apologised to any one he proceeded however i was in truth rather irritable this morning and i hastily took up an opinion which i since find from the conversation of monsieur le comte was totally false namely that you were using all your endeavours to dissuade him from the only step which can save himself and his country from ruin our levies were nearly made our envoy on his very return from the low countries all our plans concerted and the count perfectly determined but the very day before your arrival now i find him again undetermined and though i am convinced i was in error yet you will own that it was natural i should attribute this change to your counsels 
"'Your excellence attributed to me,' I replied with a smile at the importance wherewith a suspicious person often contrives to invest a circumstance, or a person who has really none. "'Your excellence attributed to me much more influence with Monsieur le Comte than I possess. But if it would interest you at all to hear what are the opinions of a simple gentleman of His Highness's household, and by what rule he has determined to govern his conduct, I have not the slightest objection to give you as clear an insight into my mind as you have just given me of your own. The Duke, perhaps, felt that he was not acting a very candid part, and he rather hesitated while he replied that such a confidence would give him pleasure. "'My opinion, then, my lord,' replied I, "'of that step which you think necessary to the Count's safety, namely a civil war, is that it is the most dangerous he could take, except that of hesitating after once having fully determined. "'But why do you think it so dangerous?' demanded the Duke. "'Surely no conjecture could be more propitious. We have troops and supplies and allies, internal and external, which place success beyond a doubt. The Count is adored by the people and by the army. Scarcely ten men will be found in France to draw a sword against him. He is courage and bravery itself, an able politician, an excellent general, a man of vigorous resolution. This was said so seriously that it was difficult to suppose the Duke was not in earnest, and yet to believe that a man of his keen sagacity was blind to the one great weakness of the Prince's character was absolutely impossible. If it was meant as a sort of bait to draw me from my opinions of the Count, it did not succeed, for I suspected it at the time, and replied at once, "'Most true, he is all that you say. And yet, Monsieur de Bouillon, though my opinion or assistance can be of little consequence, either in one scale or the other, my determination is fixed to oppose to the utmost of my power any steps towards war, whenever his highness does me the honour of speaking to me on the subject, so long, at least, as I see that his mind remains undetermined. The moment, however, I hear him declare that he has taken his resolution, no one shall be more strenuous than myself in endeavouring to keep him steady therein. From that instance I shall conceive myself, and strive to make him believe, that one retrograde step is destruction, and I pledge myself to exert all the faculties of my mind and body, as far as those very limited faculties may go, to assist and promote the enterprise to the utmost of my power. "'If that be the case,' replied the Duke, "'I feel sure that I shall this very night be able to show that war is now inevitable, "'and to determine the Count to pronounce for it himself. "'A council will be held at ten o'clock to-night on various matters of importance, "'and I doubt not that His Highness will require your assistance and opinion. "'Should he do so, I rely upon your word to do all that you can to close the door on retrocession.' when once the Count has chosen his line of conduct. The noble Duke now spoke in the real tone of his feelings. To do him justice, he had shown infinite friendship towards his princely guest, and it was not unnatural that he should strive by every means to bring over those who surrounded the Prince to his own opinion. When, as now, he quitted all art as far as he could, for he was too much habituated to policy to abandon it ever entirely, I felt a much higher degree of respect for him, and, as he went on boldly, soliciting me to join myself to his party, and trying to lead me by argument from one step to another, I found much more difficulty in resisting than I had before experienced in seeing through and parrying his artifices. It is in times of faction and intrigue, when every single voice is of import to one party or the other, that small men gain vast consequence and apt to attribute to their individual merit the court paid to them for their mere integral weight they often sell their support to flattery and attention when they would have yielded to no other sort of bribery however much i might overrate my importance from the efforts of the duke to gain me and i do not at all deny that i did so i still continued firm and at last contenting himself with what i had at first promised he turned the conversation to myself, and I found that he had drawn from the Count so much of my history as referred to the insurrection of Catalonia and my interview with Richelieu. I felt, as we conversed, that my character and mind were undergoing a strict and minute examination, 
through the medium of every word I spoke. And, what between the vanity of appearing to the best advantage, and the struggle to hide the consciousness that I was under such a scrutiny, I believe I must have shown considerably more affectation than ability. The conviction that this was the case, too, came to embarrass me still more, and feeling that I was undervaluing my own mind altogether, I suddenly broke off at one of the Duke's questions, which somewhat too palpably smacked of the investigation with which he was amusing himself, and replied, "'Men's characters, monsieur, are best seen in their actions, when they are free to act, and in their words, when they think those words fall unnoticed. But, depend upon it, one cannot form a correct estimate of the mind of another by besieging it in form. We instantly put ourselves upon the defensive when we find an army sitting down before the citadel of the heart, and whatever be the ability of our adversary, it is very difficult either to take us by storm or make us capitulate. Nay, replied the duke, indeed you are mistaken. I had no such intention as you seem to think. My only wish was to amuse away an hour in your agreeable society, ere joining his highness to proceed with him to the council but i believe it is nearly time that i should go the duke now left me i was not at all satisfied with my own conduct during the interview that had just passed and returning to my station at the window i watched the last rays of day fade away from the sky and one bright star after another gaze out at the world below while a thousand wandering fancies filled my brain taking a calm but melancholy hue from the solemn aspect of the night and a still more gloomy one from feeling how little my own actions were under the control of my reason, and how continually, even in casual conversation, I behaved and spoke in the most opposite manner to that which reflection would have taught me to pursue. Sick of the present, my mind turned to other days. Many a memory and many a regret were busy about my heart, conjuring up dreams and hopes and wishes passed away, the throng of all those bright things we leave behind with early youth and never shall meet again if it be not in a world beyond the tomb all the sounds of earth sunk into repose so that i could hear even the soft murmur of the meurs and the sighing of the summer breeze wandering through the embrasures of the citadel the cares the labours the anxieties and all the grievous realities of life seemed laid in slumber with the day that nursed them while fancy, imagination, memory, everything that lives upon that which is not, seemed to assert their part and take possession of the night. I remembered many such a starry sky in my own beautiful land, when without a heartache or a care I had gazed upon the splendour of the heavens and raised my heart in adoration of him that spread it forth. But now I looked out into the deep darkness and found painful, painful memory mingling gall with all the sweetness of its contemplation i thought of my sweet helen and remembered how many an obstacle was cast between us i thought of my father who had watched my youth like an opening flower who had striven to instil into my mind all that was good and great and i recollected the pain that my unexplained absence must have given i thought of my mother who had nursed my infant years who had founded all her happiness on me, who had watched and wept and suffered for me in my illness, and I called up every tone of her voice, every glance of her eye, every smile of her lip, till my heart ached even with the thoughts it nourished. And a tear, I believe, found its way into my eye, when suddenly, as it fixed upon the darkness, something white seemed to glide slowly across before me. It had the form, it had the look, it had the aspect of my mother. My eyes strained upon it, as if they would have burst from their sockets. I saw it distinct and plain, as I could have seen her in the open day. My heart beat, my brain whirled, and I strove to speak, but my words died upon my lips, and when at length I found the power to utter them, the figure was gone, and all was blank darkness, and the bright stars twinkling through the deep azure of the sky. I know, I feel sure now, as I sit and reason upon it, that the whole was imagination, to which the hour, the darkness, and my own previous thoughts all contributed. But still, the fancy must have been most overpoweringly strong to have thus compelled the very organs of vision to cooperate in the deceit, 
and at the moment I had no more doubt that I had seen the spirit of my mother than I had of my own existence. The memory of the whole remained still as strongly impressed upon my mind as ever, and certainly, as far as actual impressions went, every circumstance appeared as substantially true as any other thing we see in the common course of events. Memory, however, leaves the mind to reason calmly, and I repeat that I believe the whole to have been produced by a highly excited imagination, for I am sure that the Almighty Being who gave laws to nature, and made it beautifully regular even in its irregularities, never suffers his own laws to be changed or interrupted, except for some great and extraordinary purpose. I do not deny that such a thing has happened, or that it may happen again, but even in opposition to the seeming evidence of my senses, I will not believe that such an interruption of the regular course of nature did occur in my own case. End of chapter 40「forty one of De Lorme by G. P. R. James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter forty one. Still, at the time I believed it fully, and after a few minutes given to wild, confused imaginings, I sat down and forcibly collected my thoughts, to bend them upon all the circumstances of my fate. My mother's spirit must have appeared to me, I thought, as a warning, probably of my own approaching death. But death was a thing that in itself I little feared, for all I hoped was that some opportunity might be given me of distinguishing myself before the grave closed over my mortal career. Now all the trifles which we have time to make of consequence when existence seems indefinitely spread out before us, lost their value in my eyes, as I imagined, or rather as I felt, what we ought always to feel, that every hour of being is limited. One plays boldly when one has nothing to lose, and carelessly when one has nothing to gain, and thus, in the very fancy that life was fleeting from me fast, I found a sort of confidence and firmness of mind which is generally only gained by long experience of our own powers as compared with those of others. While the thoughts of what I had seen were yet fresh in my mind, a messenger announced to me that the prince desired my presence in the great hall of the chateau as speedily as possible, and without staying to make any change of dress, I followed down the stairs. As I was crossing the lesser court, I encountered my little attendant. He had been straying somewhat negligently through the good town of Sedan, and had been kept some hours at the gates of the citadel on his return. I had not time, however, to give him any very lengthened reprehension, but bidding him go to my chamber and wait for me, I followed the Count's servant to the council hall. It was a vast, vaulted chamber in the very centre of the citadel, and the candles upon the table in the midst, though they served sufficiently to light the part of the room in which they were placed, left the whole of the rest in semi-obscurity, so that when I entered I could but see a group of dark figures seated irregularly about a council board, with several others dispersed in twos and threes, talking together in various parts of the room, as if waiting the arrival of some other person. The words, "'Here he is! Here he is!' pronounced more than once as I entered, made me almost fancy that the council had delayed its deliberations for me. But the vanity of such an idea soon received a rebuff, for a moment after the voice of the Count de Soissons himself, who sat at the head of the table, replied, "'No, no, it is only the Count de Lorme, Monsieur de Guise disdains to hurry himself. Let who will wait? Advancing to the table, I now found Monsieur le Comte with Bardouville, Varicaville, saint and several others whom I did not know, seated round the table, while the Duke of Bouillon was conversing with some strangers at a little distance. But my greatest surprise was to find Monsieur de Retz near the Count de Soissons, though I left him so short a time before at Paris. He seemed to be in deep thought, but his ideas, I believe, were not quite so abstracted as they appeared, and on my approaching him he rose and embraced me as if we had known each other for centuries, saying at the same time in my ear, I hear you have received the true faith. Be a martyr to it this night, if it be necessary. I now took a seat next to Varicaville, who whispered to me, 
we have here an ambassador from spain and you will see how laudably willing we frenchmen are to be gulled he will promise us men and money and what not this marquis de via franca but when the time comes for performance not a man nor a stiver will be forthcoming perhaps i may thwart him replied i remembering at the sound of his name that i had in my hands a pledge of some worth in the diamonds which achilles had pilfered at barcelona barry caville looked surprised but at that moment our conversation was interrupted by the duke of bouillon turning round and observing that the conduct of m de guise was unaccountable in keeping such an assembly waiting in the manner which he did to council gentlemen said the count hastily we have waited too long for this noble prince of lorraine to council the rest of the party now took their seats and the baron de beauvau rising informed the count that he had executed faithfully his embassy to the archduke leopold and the cardinal infant who each promised to furnish his highness with a contingent of seven thousand men and two hundred thousand crowns in money in case he determined upon the very just and necessary warfare to which he was called by the voice not only of all france but all europe a war which by one single blow would deliver his native country from her oppressor and restore the blessing of peace to a torn and suffering world he then proceeded to enter into various particulars and details which i now forget but it was very easy to perceive from the whole that m de beauvau was one of the strongest advocates for war he ended by stating that the marquis de villafranca then present had been sent by the cardinal infant to receive the final determination of the prince my eyes followed the direction of his as he spoke and rested on a tall dark man who sat next to the duke of bouillon listening to what passed with more animation in his looks than the nobility of spain generally allowed to appear he was simply dressed in black but about his person might be seen a variety of rich jewels evidently showing that the pillage which i had seen committed on his house at barcelona had not cured him of his passion for precious stones after the baron de beauvau had given an account of his mission the duke of bouillon rose and said that now as the noble princes of the house of austria had made them such generous and friendly offers and sent a person of such high rank to receive their determination all that remained for them to do was to fix finally whether they would by submitting to a base and oppressive minister stoop their heads at once to the block and axe and add all the most illustrious names of france to the catalogue of richelieu's murders or whether they would by one great and noble effort cast off the chains of a usurper and free their king their country and themselves the duke spoke long and eloquently he urged the propriety of war upon every different motive upon expediency upon necessity upon patriotism he addressed himself first to the nobler qualities of his hearers their courage their love of their country their own honour and dignity and then to those still stronger auxiliaries their weaknesses their vanity their ambition their pride their avarice but while he did so he artfully spread a veil over them all lest shame should step in and recognising them in their nakedness hold them back from the point towards which he led them he spoke as if for the whole persons there assembled and as if seeking to win them each to his opinion but his speech was in fact directed towards the count de soissons on whose determination of course the whole event depended Varicaville did not suffer the duke's persuasions to pass without casting his opinion in the still wavering balance of the count's mind and urging in plain but energetic language every motive which could induce the prince to abstain from committing himself to measures that he might afterwards disapprove it is a common weakness with irresolute people always to attach more importance to a new opinion than to an old one and monsieur le comte turning to de retz pressed him to speak his sentiments upon the measure under consideration the abbe declined protesting his inexperience and incapability as long as such abnegation might set forth his modesty to the best advantage and enhance the value of his opinion 
but when he found himself urged he rose and spoke somewhat to the following effect i see myself surrounded by the best and dearest friends of monsieur le comte and yet i am bold to say that there is not one noble gentleman amongst them who has a warmer love for his person or a greater regard for his dignity and honour than myself did i see that dignity in danger did i see that honour touched by his remaining in inactivity my voice should be the first for war but while both are in security nothing shall ever make me counsel him to a measure by which both are hazarded i speak merely of m le comte for it is his interests that we are here to consider it is he that must decide our actions and it is his honour and reputation that are risked by the determination to me it appears clear that by remaining at peace his dignity is in perfect safety his retreat to sedan guarded him against the meanness to which the minister wished to force him the general hatred borne towards the cardinal turns the whole warmth of popular love and popular admiration towards the count's exile the favour of the people also is always more secure in inactivity than in activity because the glory of action depends upon success of which no one can be certain that of inaction in the present circumstances is sure being founded on public hatred towards a minister one of those unalterable things on which one may always count the public always have hated and always will hate the minister be he who he will and be his talents and his virtues what they may we have at first a momentary popularity and he may have brief returns of it but envy hatred and malice towards the minister are always at the bottom of the vulgar heart and as they could never get through life without having the devil to charge with all their sins so can they never be contented without laying all their woes misfortunes cares and grievances to the door of the minister thus then hating the cardinal irremediably they will always love the count as his enemy unless his highness risks his own glory by involving the nation in intestine strife it is therefore my most sincere opinion that as long as the minister does not himself render war inevitable the interest the honour the dignity of the prince all require peace richelieu's bodily powers are every day declining while the hatred of the people every day increases towards him and their love for m le comte augments in the same proportion in the meanwhile the eyes of all europe behold with admiration a prince of the blood royal of france enduring a voluntary exile rather than sacrifice his dignity and with the power and influence to maintain himself against all the arts and menaces of a usurping minister still patriotically refraining from the hazardous experiment of war which in compensation for certain calamities offers nothing but a remote and uncertain event peace then let us have peace at least till such time as war becomes inevitable while de retz spoke the duke of bouillon had regarded him with a calm sort of sneer the very coolness of which led me to think that he still calculated upon deciding the prince to war and the moment the other had done he observed monsieur le damoiseau souverain de commerci one of the titles of de retz methinks for so young a man you are marvellously peaceably disposed duke of bouillon said de retz fixing on him his keen dark eye were it not for the gratitude which all the humble friends of monsieur le comte feel towards you on his account i should be tempted to remind you that you may not always be within the security of your own bastions hush hush my friends cried the count let us have no jarring at our council table bouillon my noble cousin you are wrong de retz has surely as much right to express his opinion when asked by me as any man present come monsieur de l'orme give us your counsel i replied without hesitation that my voice was still for peace as long as it was possible to maintain it but that when once war was proved to be unavoidable the more boldly it was undertaken and the more resolutely it was carried out the greater was the probability of success and the surer the honour to be gained such also is my opinion said the prince and on this then let us conclude to remain at peace till we are driven to war but to act so as to make our enemies repent it 
when they render war inevitable. "'Whether it is so or not at this moment,' said the Duke of Bouillon, "'your Highness will judge after having cast your eyes over that paper.' And he laid a long written scroll before the Count de Soissons. The Count raised it, and all eyes turned upon him while he read. After running over the first ordinary forms, the Count's brow contracted, and biting his lip he handed the paper to Varicaville, bidding him read it aloud. "'It is fit,' said he, "'that all should know and witness, that necessity, and not inclination, leads me to plunge my country in the misfortunes of civil war. Read, Varicaville, read!' Varicaville glanced his eyes over the paper, and then, with somewhat of an unsteady voice, read the following proclamation. "'In the King's name!' Dear and well-beloved, the fears which we entertain that certain rumours lately spread abroad of new factions and conspiracies, whereby various of our rebellious subjects endeavour to trouble the repose of our kingdom, should inspire you with vain apprehensions, you not knowing the particulars, have determined us to make those particulars public, in order that you may render thanks to God for having permitted us to discover the plots of our enemies, in time to prevent their malice from making itself felt to the downfall of the state we should never have believed after the lenity and favour which we have on all occasions shown to our cousin the count de soissons more especially in having pardoned him his share in the horrible conspiracy of sixteen thirty six that he would have embarked in similar designs had not the capture of various seditious emissaries sent into our provinces for the purpose of exciting rebellion of levying troops against our service of debauching our armies and of shaking the fidelity of our subjects together with the confessions of the said emissaries fully proved and established the criminality of our said cousin's designs the levies which are publicly made under commissions from our said cousin the hostilities committed upon the bodies of our faithful soldiers established in guard upon the frontiers of champagne the confession of the courier called vaucelle who has most providentially fallen into our hands stating that he has been sent on the part of the said count de soissons the dukes of guise and bouillon to our dearly beloved brother gaston duke of orleans for the purpose of seducing our said brother to join and aid in the treasonable plans of the said conspirators and the farther confession of the said vaucelle stating that the count de soissons together with the dukes of guise and bouillon conjointly and severally had treated and conspired with the cardinal Infant of spain from whom they had received and were to receive notable sums of money and from whom they expected the aid and abetment of various bodies of troops and warlike munitions designed to act against their native country of france and us their born liege lord and sovereign these and various other circumstances having given us clear knowledge and cognizance of that whereof we would willingly have remained in doubt we are now called upon in justice to ourselves and to our subjects to declare and pronounce the said count de soissons together with the dukes of guise and bouillon and all who shall give them aid assistance counsel or abetment enemies of the state of france and rebels to their lawful sovereign without within the space of one month from the date hereof they present themselves at our court wherever it may be for the time established and humbly acknowledging their fault have recourse to our royal clemency signed louis no paper could have been better devised for restoring union to the councils of the count de soissons war was now inevitable and after a good deal of hurried desultory conversation in which no one but the duke of bouillon showed any great presence of mind my opinion as the youngest person at the table was the first formally called for by the count de soissons i had not yet spoken since the king's proclamation had been read and had been sitting listening with some surprise to find that men of experience talents and high repute carried on great enterprises in the same desultory and irregular manner that schoolboys would plot a frolic on their master. I rose, however, with the more boldness, while Varicaville muttered to himself, The Spaniard will carry the day. I resolved, however, that this prognostication 
should not be wholly fulfilled if i could help it and addressing monsieur le comte i said your highness has done me the honour of asking my opinion there can be now i believe but one war appears to me to be now necessary not only to your dignity but to your safety and whereas i before presumed to recommend inaction i now think that nothing but activity can ensure us success for my own part i am ready to take any post your highness may think fit to assign me one of the first things however i should conceive would be to secure the capital and the next to complete the levies of troops so that the regiments be filled to their entire number neither of these objects are to be effected without money and as the cardinal Infant has promised a considerable sum and the minister in his proclamation gives you credit for having received it i hope the marquis de villafranca comes prepared to fulfil at least in part the expectations held out by his royal principal most unfortunately replied the marquis in very good french at the time of my departure no idea was entertained that the french government would so precipitate its measures otherwise his highness the cardinal Infant, would have sent the promised subsidy at the time and i know that no one will regret so much as he does this unavoidable delay varicaville looked at me with a meaning smile and indeed it was evident enough as it was afterwards proved by her conduct that spain was willing to hurry us into war without lending us any aid to bring it to a successful determination i therefore rejoined without hesitation feeling that the proverbial rashness of youth would excuse some flippancy and that i could not carry through my plan without under these circumstances it seems to me very likely that spain our excellent ally will save both her money and her troops for probably before her tardy succour arrives we shall have struck the blow and gained the battle but what can be done young sir demanded villafranca hastily spain will keep her promise to the very utmost on my honour on my conscience had i the means of raising any part of the sum in time to be of service i would myself advance it notwithstanding the immense losses i sustained by the catalonian rebels many a man's honour and his conscience would be in a very uncomfortable situation if the means of taking them out of pawn were presented to him on a sudden that consideration however did not induce me to spare m de villafranca whom i believed from all i had heard of him to be as tergiversating a diplomatist as ever the subtle house of austria had sent forth i replied therefore if that be the case and who can doubt the noble marquis's words i think i can furnish the means whereby m de villafranca can fulfil his generous designs and put it in his power instantly to raise great part of the sum required every one stared and no one more than the marquis himself but rising from the council table i whispered to varicaville to keep the same subject under discussion till i returned and flying across the courts of the arsenal i mounted to my own chamber achilles cried i as soon as i entered the marquis de villafranca is here in the arsenal are you still resolved to restore him the diamonds i am resolved to have nothing to do with them myself replied achilles but since the adventure at lyon i find that i had better give up both gold and diamonds and content myself with simple silver for the rest of my life if i would not be whipped through the streets and turned out in a grey gown but as to giving them back all i can say is your sublimity is a great fool if you do not keep them yourself it will be of more service to me to give them than to keep them replied i but i will not do so without your consent and having by this time drawn them out of the valise i held them out towards him give them give them then in god's name cried the little man shutting his eyes but do not let me see them for their sparkling makes my resolution wax dim take them away monsieur if you love me take them away my virtue is no better than that of Danae of old. I did as he required, and hurried back to the council chamber, where all eyes turned upon me as I entered, and I found that the five minutes of my absence had been wasted on conjectures of what I could mean. Monsieur de Villafranca, said I, as soon as I had taken my seat, you said, I think, that if you had any means of raising even a part of the sum required, in time to be of service, 
you would advance it yourself upon your honour and conscience now it so happened that a person with whom i am acquainted was at barcelona when your house was plundered and in that city bought this string of diamonds which were said to have belonged to you and i held them up glittering in the light while the eyes of the marquis seemed to sparkle in rivalry he gave them to me i proceeded and i am willing to return them to you on condition that you instantly pledge them to three quarters of their value to the jewellers of this city the money arising therefrom to be poured into the treasury of m le comte and you shall also give father an hundred pistoles to the person who saved them from the hands of the rabble of barcelona he being a poor and needy man the proposal was received with loud applause by every one except the marquis de villafranca whose face grew darker and darker at every word i spoke this is very hard said he with the most evident design in the world to retreat from his proposal those diamonds are family jewels of inestimable value to me they are nevertheless diamonds which you shall never see again replied i except upon the conditions which i mention nor do i see that it is hard m le comte will give you an acknowledgment for so much as they produce as a part of the subsidy from spain advanced by you upon the sight of that your own prince will repay you deducting that sum from the amount which he is about to transmit to m le comte m de l'orme's observation is just said the duke of bouillon you express the most decided conviction m le marquis that his royal highness would instantly send us the subsidy if so the count de soissons acknowledgment will be as good as a bill of exchange upon your own prince but the proverb says replied the marquis put not your faith in princes it should have said put not your faith in marquises rejoined i somewhat indignant at his attempt at evasion however monsieur le marquis the matter stands thus if you consent to what i propose we will send for the jewellers the sum shall be paid and you shall have the count's acknowledgment then if you can get the money from your prince you have the means of regaining the diamonds with the sole loss of a hundred pistoles if your prince did not intend to pay the subsidy and you were not quite convinced that he would pay it you should not have promised it here in his name and backed it with your most solemn assurances of your own conviction on the subject at all events whether he pays it or not you are no worse than when you thought the diamonds were irretrievably lost but so far the better that you have had an opportunity of showing how willingly you perform what you pledged your honour and conscience you would do if you had the means a slight laugh that ran round the council table at his last sentence i believe determined m de villafranca to yield without any more resistance seeing very well at the same time that the only existing chance of recovering his diamonds at all was to consent to what i proposed he felt well convinced i am sure that the cardinal Infant had not the slightest intention in the world of paying the sum which he had promised but however he had a better chance of obtaining his part thereof than any one else and therefore as there was no other means of ensuring that his beloved brilliance would not be scattered over half the habitable globe before six weeks were over he signified his assent to their being deposited with the jewellers of sedan in a tone of resignation worthy of a martyr the syndic of the jewellers with two or three of his most reputable companions were instantly sent for by the council and during the absence of the messengers a variety of particulars were discussed and various plans were adopted for the purpose of commencing the war with vigour and carrying it on with success amongst other things the prince announced his intention of entrusting all the steps preparatory to a general rising of the people of the capital to de retz and myself and though i thought that there were one or two dissatisfied looks manifested upon the subject no one judged fit to object probably weighing the risk with the honour they were quite as much pleased to be excused the count's enterprise as discontented at not having been distinguished by his selection at length the jewellers were brought before the council and by their lugubrious looks it was evident that the worthy citizens of sedan expected their noble and considerate prince to wring from them a heavy subsidy their brows cleared however when the diamonds were laid before them 
and their opinion of the value was demanded and after some consultation they named a hundred and fifty thousand crowns as a fair price the further arrangements were soon made the merchants willingly agreeing to advance a hundred thousand crowns upon the deposit of the jewels before the next morning as soon as this was concluded the marquis de villafranca drew forth his purse and counting out a hundred pistoles he pushed them across the table towards me saying with a sneering smile i suppose though your modesty has led you sir to put the good deed upon another it is in fact yourself whom i have to thank for so generously saving my diamonds amongst the plundering banditti of barcelona the blood for an instant rushed up to my cheek but it needed no long deliberation to show me that anger was but folly on such an occasion and i therefore replied with a smile your pardon most noble sir the person who with his own right hand captured your diamonds is a much more tremendous person than myself so much so that his enormous size and chivalrous prowess have obtained for him the name of achilles i will instantly send for him and you shall pay him the money yourself when you will perceive that had he been inclined to keep your jewels with a strong hand it would have been difficult to have wrung them from him achilles was brought in a minute and when i presented the diminutive insignificant little man to the marquis as the wonderful achilles le franc who had by the vigour of his invincible arm taken his diamonds the whole council burst into a laugh in which no one joined more heartily than villafranca himself achilles received his pistoles with great glee and i believe valued them more than the diamonds themselves after this it being late the council broke up and the prince retired to his own apartments desiring to speak with de retz and myself as he wished us to set out early the next morning for paris when in his own chamber he gave me an order for ten thousand crowns half of which he directed me to apply to his service amongst the highly respectable persons to whom my mission was directed and the other half he made me accept as a half year's salary advanced upon the appointments of a gentleman to his bedchamber it fortunately happened that the order directed his treasurer to pay the money out of sums already in his hands for i own that i should have entered some scruple in accepting the part destined for myself if it had been derived from the store of crowns which i had wrung out of the marquis de villafranca's diamonds as it was necessity put all hesitation out of the question the count still had a thousand cautions and directions to give both to myself and monsieur de retz the only one of which necessary to allude to here was his desire that while i remained in paris i should inhabit the hotel de soissons this plan of proceeding was suggested by de retz who laid it down as a maxim that the sure means of concealing one's actions was to act as nobody else would have done to ensure me a kind reception and full confidence from his mother the count wrote her a short note couched in such terms as would make her comprehend his meaning without leading to any discovery should it fall into the hands of others after this we took our leave and left him to repose retiring ourselves to make preparations for our journey in the morning End of chapter forty one Chapter forty two of De Lorme by G. P. R. James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter forty two. Day had scarcely dawned when Monsieur de Retz and myself mounted our horses in the courtyard of the citadel and set out on our return to Paris. We were accompanied by but one servant each, for the decided part which the minister had taken left no doubt that all the avenues to Sedan would be watched with unslumbering vigilance after a short discussion it was determined that we should not attempt the direct road and therefore instead of crossing the bridge of sedan we followed the course of the meurs for some way at a village however about two miles from the city we learned that the passages of the rivers were guarded and de retz proposed to return to sedan and cross by the bridge my opinion however was different where we then stood the river was narrow and not very rapid our horses fresh and strong so that it appeared to me much more advisable to attempt the passage here than by riding up and down the bank to call attention to our proceedings 
the only objection arose with little achilles who had a mortal aversion to being drowned and declared that he could not and that he would not swim his horse over i decided the matter for him however for at a moment when he had approached close to the bank to contemplate more nearly the horrible feat that was proposed to him i seized his horse by the bridle and spurring in was soon half-way across leading him after me his terror and distress when he began to feel the buoyant motion of a horse in swimming were beyond description but as there was no resource he behaved more wisely than terrified people generally do and sitting quite still let his fate take its course cutting across the country sometimes over fields sometimes through small bridle paths and by roads we at length entered the highway at a point where suspicion had she been inclined to exercise her ingenuity upon us might have imagined that we had come from a thousand other places with fully as great likelihood as sedan as for the road a little higher up branched into five others each of which conducted in a different direction our journey now passed tranquilly and on the evening of the third day we arrived at paris it was too late to present myself to the countess de soissons that night and m de retz offering me an apartment in his hotel i accepted it for the time not ill-pleased to see as much as possible of the extraordinary man into whose society i had been thrown and commenting upon his character fully as much as he did in all probability upon mine on our journey we had laughed over the circumstances of our former meeting but i found that he still entertained great doubts of my discretion by the frequent warnings he gave me not to communicate anything i had seen at sedan to the countess de soissons it is a good general rule said he never to tell a woman the truth in any circumstances praise her faults abuse her enemies humour her weakness gratify her vanity but never never tell her the truth one's deportment with a woman ought to be like a deep lake reflecting everything but letting no one see the bottom m de retz's policy was not always exactly to my taste but as the count de soissons had not bid me to communicate any of his affairs to his mother i resolved of course to keep them as secret from her as from any other person as soon as i imagined that such a visit would be acceptable on the subsequent morning i proceeded on horseback to the hotel de soissons wearing for the first time my fine spanish dress of white silk de retz having warned me that in all points of ceremony the countess de soissons showed no lenity to offenders to make the suit at all harmonized with a ride on horseback i was obliged to add a pair of white leather buskins to the rest but as this was quite the mode of the day m de retz declared my apparel exquisite and being himself not a little of a petit maître notwithstanding both his philosophy and his cloth he looked with a deep sigh at his black soutane which he had resumed since our arrival at paris and declared that he had no small mind to cast away the gown and draw the sword himself with a smile at human inconsistency i left him and rode away and passing by my old auberge in the rue des prouvaires soon reached the hotel de soissons here i delivered the count's note of introduction to a servant bidding him present it to the princess and inform her that the gentleman to whom it referred waited her pleasure i was not kept long in attendance in a few minutes the servant returned and bade me follow him to the apartments of the countess we mounted the grand staircase and proceeding through a suite of splendid rooms the windows of which were almost all composed of stained glass bearing the ciphers c s and c n interlaced for charles de soissons and catherine de navarre we at length reached the chamber in which the princess was seated with her women she was working at an embroidery frame while a pretty girl of about sixteen stood beside her holding the various silks of which she was making use on my being announced she raised her head showing a face in which the wreck of many beauties might still be traced and fixed her eyes somewhat sternly upon me first letting them rest upon my face and then glancing over my whole person with a grave and dissatisfied air 
"'You come here, young sir,' said she at length, "'dressed like a bridegroom, but you will go away like a mourner. "'Your mother is dead.' "'God of heaven! "'Till that moment I had not an idea that, on the earth, "'there was a being so unfeeling as thus to communicate to a son "'that the tie between him and the author of his being "'was riven by the hand of death. And yet the Countess of Soissons acted not from unfeeling motives. She fancied me guilty of follies that, in her eyes, were crimes, and she thought, by the terrible blow that she struck, at once to reprove and reclaim me. At first I did not comprehend. I could not, I would not believe that she spoke truly. When seeing my doubts in the vacancy of my expression, she calmly repeated what she had said. What change took place then in my countenance I know not, but, however, it was sufficient to alarm her for the consequences of what she had done, and starting up she called loudly to her women to bring water, wine, anything to relieve me. To imagine what I felt will not be easy for any other, even when it is remembered how I loved the parent I had lost, how I had left her, how deeply she had loved me, and how suddenly, how unexpectedly, I heard that the whole was at an end, and that the cold grave lay between us for ever. My agitation was so extreme that, totally forgetting the presence of the princess, I cast myself into a chair, and, covering my face with my hands, remained speechless and motionless for nearly a quarter of an hour. During this time, the Countess de Soissons, passing from one extreme to the other, did everything she could to soothe and calm me and, had I been her own son, she could not for the time have shown me more kindness. She was frightened, I believe, at the state into which she had thrown me, and was still endeavouring to make me speak, when a tall, venerable old man entered the chamber, but paused, I believe, on seeing the confusion that reigned within. She instantly called him to her assistance, telling him what she had done, and pointing out the consequences it had had upon me. He approached, and after feeling my pulse, drew forth a lancet, and calling for a basin, bled me profusely. "'You have done wrong, my daughter,' said he, turning to the countess, with an air of authority, which she bore more meekly than might have been expected. "'Mildness wins hearts, while unkindness can but break them. Leave me with this young gentleman, and I doubt not soon to restore him to himself.' The countess did as he bade her, without reply, and, desiring her women to bring her embroidery frame, she left the apartment. The bleeding had instantly relieved me. Every drop that flowed had seemed so much taken from an oppressive load that overburdened my heart, and when the old man sat down by me and asked if I was better, I could answer him in the affirmative and thank him for his assistance. "'I will not attempt to console you, my son,' he proceeded, "'for you have met with a deep and irreparable loss. "'From all I hear, your mother was one of the best and most amiable of women, "'and through a long life we meet with so very few on whom our hearts can fix, "'that every time death numbers one of them for his own, "'he leaves a deep and irremediable wound with us, "'that none but time can assuage, "'and time himself ought never wholly to heal.' I know, too, at the moment when we find that fate has put its immovable barrier between us and those we loved, when the cold, small portal of the grave is shut against our communion with our friends, I know that it is then that every pain we have given them is visited with double anguish upon our own hearts, and a crowd of bitter unavailing regrets fills every way of memory with dark and horrible forms. I wept bitterly for he had touched a chord to which my feelings vibrated but too sensitively. In the gaieties of life, he proceeded, in the pleasures of society, in the passions, the interests, the desires of human existence, and of our own earthly nature, we often forget those finer feelings, those better, brighter, nobler sentiments, which belong to the soul alone. Nor is it till irretrievable is stamped upon our actions, that we truly feel where we have been wanting in duty, in gratitude, in affection. But when we do feel it, we ought to have a care not to let those regrets pass away in vain tears and ineffectual sorrow, thus wasting the most blessed remedy that heaven has given to the diseases of the soul, 
on the contrary we should apply them to our future conduct and by gathering instruction from the past and improvement from remorse should find in the chastisement of heaven the blessing it was intended to be as i recovered from the first shock of the tidings i had just heard i had time to consider more particularly the person who spoke to me as i have said he was an old man and from the perfect silver of his hair and beard i should have supposed him above seventy but the erectness of his carriage the whiteness of his teeth and the pure undimmed fire of his eye took much from his look of age his dress though it consisted of a long black robe was certainly not clerical and from the skill with which he had bled me i was rather inclined to suppose that his profession tended more towards the cure of bodies than of souls in reply to his mild homily which appeared to me notwithstanding the gentleness of his language to point at greater errors than any i could charge myself with towards the parent i had lost i could only answer that it was hardly possible for a being made up of human weakness to be so continually brought in connection with another as a son must be with a mother without falling into some faults towards her but that even now when memory and affection joined to magnify all i had done amiss in regard to the dead i could recall no instance in which i had intentionally given her pain an explanation ensued and i found that my mother when on her deathbed had written to the countess de soissons informing her of my disappearance from bigorre and attributing it to love for the daughter of a roturier in the vicinity who had also quitted the province shortly after she gave no name and no description but she begged the countess de soissons to cause search to be made for me in paris and to endeavour to rescue me from the debasing connection into which she said the blood of bigot should have held me from ever entering it is under these circumstances proceeded the old man that the princess addressed you this morning with the abrupt news of your mother's death hoping by the remorse which that news would occasion to win you at once from the unhappy entanglement into which you have fallen that the countess de soissons should be mistaken replied i does not surprise me for she did not know me but that my mother should suppose any passion whether worthy or unworthy would have led me to inflict so much pain upon her and on my father as my unexplained absence must have done does astonish and afflict me indeed though my own death might have been the consequence of my stay i was weak to fly as i did nor should i have done so had my mind been in a state to judge sanely of my own conduct will you sir have the goodness to inform the countess de soissons that the suspicions of my mother were entirely unfounded and that i neither fled with any one nor for the purpose of meeting any one as she must evidently see from my having found and attached myself to monsieur le comte my absence sir was occasioned by my having accidentally slain one of my fellow-creatures and my having no means of proving that i did so accidentally it has been a most unhappy mistake replied the old man for undoubtedly it has been this idea that wounded your mother to the heart but i hurt you do not let me do so if it has been a mistake you are no way answerable for it i now go to give your message to the countess and will bring you a few lines addressed to you from your mother but which you must remember were written under erroneous feelings thus saying he left me and in a few minutes returned with the letter he had mentioned the countess said he is most deeply grieved at the mistake which has arisen and especially at having by her abruptness aggravated the grief which you cannot but most poignantly feel this is the letter i spake of but you had better read it in private if you will follow me i will conduct you to an apartment which while you remain at the hotel de soissons the countess begs you would look upon as your own i followed him in silence to a splendid suite of rooms wherein he left me and i had now time to indulge in all the painful thoughts to which the irreparable loss i had sustained gave rise for some time i did not open my mother's letter letting my thoughts wander through the field of the past and recalling with agonizing exactness every bright quality of the mind and every gentle feeling of the heart now laid in the dust her love for me rose up as in judgment against me and i felt that i had never known how much i loved her till death had rendered that love in vain 
memory so still so silent so faithless in the hurry of passion and the pursuit of pleasure now raised her voice and with painful care traced all that i had lost a thousand minute traits a thousand kind and considerate actions a thousand touches of generosity of feeling of tenderness every word every look of many long years of affection passed in review before me and sad sad was the vision when i thought that it was all gone for ever anything was better than that contemplation and with an aching heart i opened the letter the wavering and irregular lines traced while life still remained a faint struggle against death the mark of a tear given to the long painful adieu first caught my eye and wrung my very heart even before i read what follows we shall never meet again she wrote life my son and hope as far as it belongs to this earth have fled and i have nothing to think of in the world i am leaving but your happiness and that of your father i write not to reproach you louis but i write to warn and to entreat you not to disgrace a long line of illustrious ancestors by a marriage which depend upon it will be as unhappy in the end as it is degrading in itself this is my last wish my last command my last entreaty observe it as you would merit the blessing which i send you adieu my son adieu you may meet with many to cherish with many to love you but oh the love of a mother is far beyond any other that binds being to being on this earth adieu once more adieu it is perhaps a weakness and yet i cannot help thinking that even after this hand is dust my spirit might know and feel consoled if my son came to shed a tear on the stone which will soon cover the ashes of his mother every word found its way to my heart and reverting to what i had seen on the night previous to my departure from sedan i fancied that my mother's spirit had itself come to enforce her dying words and yielding to the feelings of the moment i mentally promised to obey her to the very utmost nay more with a superstitious idea that her eye could look upon me even then i kneeled and declared with as much fervency as ever vow was offered to heaven itself that i would follow her will and as soon as the enterprise to which my honour bound me was at an end would visit her tomb and pay that tribute to her memory which she had herself desired then casting myself into a seat i leaned my head upon my hands and gave full rein to every painful reflection let me pass over two days which i spent entirely in the chamber that had been allotted to me during that time every attention was paid to me by the servants of the countess de soissons and the old man whom i have before mentioned visited me more than once every time i saw him gaining upon my good opinion by the kind and judicious manner in which he endeavoured to soothe and console me without either blaming or opposing my grief still no word that fell from him gave me the least intimation in regard to the character in which he acted in the hotel de soissons though from the evident influence he possessed over the countess it was one of no small authority from him however i learned that my father had written briefly to the countess de soissons informing her of my mother's death to me he had not written and though i could easily conceive from his habits and character that he had shrunk from a task so painful in itself yet i could not help imagining that displeasure had some part in his silence on the evening of the second day i received a visit from de retz who notwithstanding all that had happened used every argument to stimulate me to action and in truth i felt that in my own griefs i was neglecting the interest of the prince i accordingly promised him that the next day i would exert myself as he wished and after conversing for some time on the affairs of the count i described to him the old man i had met with and asked him if he knew him slightly he replied he is an italian by birth and his name vanoni a man of infinite talent and profound learning but his name is not in very good odour amongst our more rigid ecclesiastics because he is reported to dive a little into those sciences which they hold as sacrilegious he is known to be an excellent astronomer and some people will have it astrologer also though i should suppose he has too much of real and substantial knowledge 
to esteem very highly that which is, in all probability, imaginary. Have you not remarked that there are fully more vulgar minds in the higher classes than there are elevated ones in the lower? Well, the vulgar part of our noblesse, called Signor Vanoni, the Countess de Soissons necromancer, though I believe the highest degree to which he can pretend in the occult sciences is that of astrologer. And even that he keeps so profoundly concealed that their best proof of it hardly amounts to suspicion. After de Retz left me, being resolved at all events to waste no more time, every instant of which was precious to such enterprises as that of Monsieur le Comte, I desired Achilles to find me out the archer who had so well aided him in recovering my ring, and to bring him to me early the next morning. This he accordingly executed, and at my breakfast, which was served in my own apartments, my little attendant presented to me a tall, solemn personage, who looked wise enough to have passed for a fool, had it not been for a certain twinkling spirit, that every now and then peeped out at the corner of his eye, and seemed to say that the obtuseness of his deportment was but a mask to hide the acuter mind within. I made these observations while I amused him for a moment or two in empty conversation, till I could find an opportunity of dismissing two lackeys of the Countess, who had orders to wait upon me at my meals, and by what I perceived I judged that it would be a difficult matter to conceal my own purpose from such a person, while I drew from him what information I required. I resolved, however, to attempt it, and consequently, when the servants were gone, I turned to the subject of my ring, and saying that I really thought he had been insufficiently paid for the talent and activity he had shown upon the occasion, I begged his acceptance of a gold piece. The man looked in my face with a dead flat stupidity of aspect, which completely covered all his thoughts, but at the same time I very well divined that he did not in the least attribute the piece of gold to the affair of the ring. He followed the sure policy, however, of closing his hand upon the money, making me a low bow, with that most uncommitting sentence, "'Monsieur is very good.' "'I suppose,' proceeded I, "'that the strange fact of pipeurs, swindlers, swashbucklers, and bravos of all description, continually evading the pursuit of Dame Justice, notwithstanding her having such acute servants as yourself, is more to be attributed to your humanity,' than to your ignorance of their secrets. This was put half as a question, half as a position, but in such a way as evidently to show that it led to something else. An intelligent gleam sparked in the corner of the archer's eye, and I fancied that some information concerning the worthy fraternity I inquired after was about to follow. But he suddenly gave a glance towards Achilles, and resuming his look of stolidity, replied, "'Monsieur is very good.' "'Go to Monsieur de Retz, Achilles,' said I, "'and tell him that if it suits his convenience "'I will be with him in an hour.' "'Achilles was not slow in taking the hint, "'and when he was gone I proceeded, "'spreading out upon the table some ten pieces of gold. "'About these swashbucklers,' said I, "'I am informed they are a large fraternity.' "'Fast!' replied the archer in a more communicative tone. "'And pray, where do they principally dwell?' demanded I. "'In every part of Paris,' said the archer, looking up in my face, "'from the Place Royale to the darkest nook of the Faubourg Saint-Antoine. "'But it is dangerous for a gentleman to venture amongst them.' "'I saw he began to wax communicative, "'and I pushed a piece of gold across the table to confirm his good disposition. "'The gold disappeared, and the archer went on. "'I would not advise you to venture among them, monsieur, "'but if you would tell me what sort of men you want,' Doubtless I could find them for you, and I keep counsel. Why, my good friend, replied I, I did not exactly say that I wanted any men, but if you will call me over the names and qualities of two or three of your most respectable acquaintances, I will see whether they be such as may suit my service. The archer paused for a moment, screwing up his eye into a curious air of sharp contemplation, and then suddenly replied, If I knew what your lordship wanted them for, I could better proportion their abilities. "'For general service, man, for general service,' replied I. "'The men I require must obey my word, defend my life, drug my enemies, brawl for my friends, and in no case think of the consequences. 
"'I understand,' replied the archer. "'I understand. "'There are Jean Le Mestre and François Le Nain, "'but I doubt they are too coarse-handed for your purpose. "'They are fit for nothing but robbing a travelling jeweller "'or frightening an old woman into fits. "'They won't exactly do,' replied I, "'at least if we can find any others.' "'Oh, plenty of others, plenty of others,' said the archer. "'Then there are Pierre Latneau and Martin La Choline. "'They were once, too, as sweet youths as ever graced the Place de Grève, "'but they have been spoiled by bad company. "'They took service with the Marquis de Saint-Brie, "'and such service ruins a man for life.' "'I should certainly suppose it did,' replied I. "'But proceed to some others. "'We have only heard of four yet.' "'Don't be afraid,' said the archer. "'I have a long list. "'Your lordship would not like a Jesuit. "'They are devilish cunning. "'Sharp hands, men of action, too. "'I know an excellent Jesuit, "'who would suit you to a hair in many respects. "'He is occasionally employed, too, "'by Monsieur de Noyer, one of our ministers, "'and would cheat the devil himself. "'But as I do not pretend to half the cunning "'of his infernal majesty,' replied I, this worthy Jesuit might cheat me, too. That is very possible, answered the archer. But stay, he proceeded thoughtfully. I have got the very men that will do. You need a brace, monsieur. Of course you need a brace. There is Combelet de Carignan, one of our most gallant gentlemen, and Jacques Moqueur, as he is called, because he laughs at everything. They were both in the secret service of his eminence, the cardinal. But they one day did a little business on their own account, which came to his ears, and he vowed that he would give them a touch of the round bedstead. They knew him to be a man of his word, so they made their escape, till the matter blew by, and now they are living here in Paris on other means. "'And pray, what is the round bedstead?' demanded I. "'Something unpleasant, doubtless, from its giving such celerity to the motions of your friends.' "'Nothing but a certain wheel in the inside of the Bastille,' replied the archer, "'on which a gentleman is suffered to repose himself quietly "'after all his bones are put out of joint. "'But, as I was saying, these two gallants are just the men for your lordship's service. "'Bold, dexterous, cunning, and they have withal a spice of honour and chivalry about them, "'which makes them marvellously esteemed amongst their fellows. "'Will they suit you, monsieur?' "'I think they will,' replied I. "'But I must see them first. "'Nothing so easy,' answered the archer. "'I will bring them here at any hour your lordship pleases to name.' "'Not here,' replied I. "'I must not take too many liberties with the Hôtel de Soissons, "'but I have a lodging in the Rue des Prêts Saint-Paul, "'on the left hand going down, "'the fifth door from the corner, "'nearly opposite a grocer's shop. "'Bring them there at dusk to-night, and accept that for your trouble.' "'So saying, I pushed him over two more of the gold pieces, "'and having once more satisfied himself that he perfectly remembered the direction I had given him, "'the archer took his leave, and I proceeded to my rendezvous with de Retz. End of chapter 42《Chapter Forty Three of De Lorme by G. P. R. James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Forty Three. Welcome, said De Retz as I entered. Most welcome. I am just about to proceed on an expedition wherein your assistance may be necessary. Will you accompany me? Anywhere you please, I replied, provided I be back by dusk. Long before that, answered De Retz. I am going to take you to the Bastille. My surprise made the abbé explain himself. You must know, said he, that there is no actual impossibility of our gaining the Bastille itself for Monsieur le Comte de Soissons, in case his first battle should be so successful as to give fair promise for an ultimate event. You like frankness, he continued, suddenly interrupting what he was saying, and I perceive you are already beginning to look surprised that I, who have hitherto shown no great confidence in your discretion, should now let you into the most dangerous secrets of this enterprise. I will frankly tell you why I do so. It is because I need someone to assist me, and because I judge it more dangerous to risk a secret with two than to confide it all to one, 
even should he not be very discreet. But I am also beginning to think more highly of your discretion. It is so bad a plan to let our first impressions become our lords, that I make a point of changing my opinion of a man as often as I can find the least opportunity. It was very difficult to know, on all occasions, whether Monsieur de Retz's frankness was spontaneous or assumed. Whichever it was, it always flowed with a view to policy, and I found that the best way of dealing with him was at first but to give to whatever he advanced that sort of negative credence, which left the mind free to act as circumstances should afterwards confirm or shake its belief. In the present case I merely thanked him for his improved opinion of me, and begged him to proceed, which he did accordingly. The Bastille, he said, serves Monsieur le Cardinal de Richelieu for many purposes, but its great utility is that it disposes of all his enemies one way or another. Those he hates, those he fears, find there a grave or a prison according to the degree of his charitable sentiments towards them. There are, however, many persons whom he fears too much to leave at liberty, yet not enough to condemn them to the rack, the block, or the dungeon. These persons are shut up in one prison or another through the kingdom, and on their first arrest are treated with some severity, but gradually, as they become regular tenants of the place, the measures against them are relaxed, and they have, at length, as much liberty as they would have in their own house, with the door shut. There are at present four men within the walls of the Bastille, who, having been there for years, are scarcely more watched than the governor himself. The Duc de Vitry, the Count de Cramal, Marshal Bassompierre, and the Marquis du Fargui. All these are known to me, and Monsieur du Fargui is my uncle, so that I am very sure of the game that I am playing. The interior discipline of the prison is at present more than ever relaxed under the present governor monsieur de tromblay and his politeness towards his prisoners is such that one or other of the four gentlemen i have named have every day one of their friends to dine with them which affords them the greatest consolation under their imprisonment i have often thus visited the prison and about ten days ago while dining with my uncle i had the opportunity of hinting to the count de Cramal, who is the cleverest man of the party the designs of monsieur le comte and at the same time proposed to him a plan for rendering ourselves masters of the bastille he has promised me an answer to-day when i have engaged myself to dine with monsieur de bassompierre and the only difficulty is to obtain an opportunity of speaking in private you doubtless have experienced how troublesome it is sometimes to win a secret moment even in a saloon judge therefore whether it is easy in a prison you must lend your aid and engage old du tromblay in conversation while i make the best use of the time you gain for me i now very well perceived that de retz had in a manner been forced to explain himself to me as there was no other person in paris acquainted with the designs of the count de soissons i therefore gave him full credit for sincerity and agreed to do my best to gain him the opportunity desired by the time this explanation was given it approached very near to one of the clock and not to commit such a rudeness as to keep waiting for their dinner a party of prisoners whose principal earthly amusement must have been to eat we set out immediately on foot it being required that we should give as little eclat to our visits to the bastille as possible a sort of mixed government then existed within the walls of the prison being garrisoned with troops as a fortress, and also very well supplied with jailers and turnkeys, to fit it for its principal capacity. Thus, though the gate was opened to us by an unarmed porter, a sentinel, iron to the teeth, presented himself in the inner court, and another at every ten steps. However, having, like the knights of the old romances, vanquished all perils of the way, we at length entered into the penetralia, and were ushered into the presence of the governor. Monsieur du Tromblay, who died about six months afterwards, was too good a man for his situation. His reception of us was as kind as if we had been guests of his own, and the prisoners whom we went to see appeared to form but a part of his own family. I was now introduced in form to the friends of Monsieur de Retz. They were all old men, 
and had in truth nothing remarkable in their appearance monsieur de vitry celebrated in history as the man who at the command of louis the thirteenth shot the maréchal d'ancre on the very steps of the louvre was the only one whose countenance promised anything like vigour but it was not to him that de retz had addressed himself in his present negotiation but to m de Clamay, whose face at all events did not prepossess one in favour of his intellect we dined and the governor seeing me dressed in mourning and as gloomy in my deportment as my garments luckily applied himself to console me with so much application that m de Cramal had his opportunity of speaking a few words to de retz in private even during dinner while m de tremblay endeavoured to solace with me with allos a la martinette and to drive out the demon sorrow with pied de cochon a la sainte menehould during the meal de retz took occasion to vaunt my skill at all games of cards though heaven knows he could not tell when he did so whether i could distinguish basset from lansquenet but taking this for a hint when the old governor asked me after dinner to make one of three at ombre i did not refuse and as soon as we were seated the abbe with m de Cramay went out to walk upon the terrace while m de vitry and du Farquy remained to look upon our game thinking to engage the governor to go on with me i let him win a few pieces though he played execrably ill but i thus fell into the common mistake of being too shrewd for my own purpose had i judged sanely of human nature i should have won his money for he would have gone on to a certainty to win it back as it was after gaining a few crowns he resigned the cards and asked if i would join the gentleman on the terrace there was no way of detaining him and therefore after making what diversion i could i followed to the spot where de retz and m de Cramay were enjoying an unobserved tete-a-tete as we came up i saw that the latter had a paper in his hand which he was evidently about to give to de retz the moment however we appeared on the terrace he paused and withdrew it the paper i knew might be of consequence but how to take off the eyes of the governor was the question i praised the view hoping he would turn to look in his astonishment for nothing was to be seen but the smoky chimneys of the faubourg st antoine but the governor only replied yes very fine and walked on i now saw that i must hazard a bold stroke and quietly insinuating the point of my sword between the governor's legs which was the more easy as he somewhat waddled in his walk i slipped the buckle of my belt the sword fell and the governor over it i tumbled over him and while the paper was given received and concealed i picked him up begged his pardon and brushed the dust off his coat after which we passed a quarter of an hour in mutually bowing and making excuses de retz then took leave and as soon as we were once more in the street i left him to peruse the paper he had received at leisure and hurried away to my lodging in the rue des prets saint paul to prepare for the reception of my archer and his recruits in going to the bastille with de retz i fancied that i saw a man suddenly turn round and follow us and on my return i evidently perceived that i was watched whatever was the object it did not at all suit me that any one should spy my actions and therefore after various hair-like doublings i turned down the rue des minimes got into the place royale and gliding under the dark side of the arcades made my escape by the other end and gradually worked my way up to my lodging my good landlady was somewhat surprised to see me but i found my apartments prepared and in order and sending for a couple of flagons of good burgundy i waited the arrival of my new attendants i found that punctuality was amongst their list of qualifications for no sooner did twilight fall than the archer made his appearance followed by two very respectable-looking personages whom he introduced to me severally as combalet de carignan and jacques moncoeur the first was a tall well-dressed gallant ruffling gaily with feathers and ribbons in profusion a steady nonchalant daring eye and a leg and arm like a hercules the face of the second jacques moncoeur was not unknown to me and memory hastily running back through the past found and brought before me in a minute 
the figure of one of those worthy sergeants who had come to examine my valise on my first arrival at paris he was the one who had shown some valour and had ventured a pass or two with me after his companion had been ejected by the window i instantly claimed acquaintance with him which he as readily admitted saying with a grin that the circumstances under which we had last met would he hoped be quite sufficient to establish his character in my opinion and show that he was well fitted for my service whatever reply he expected i answered in the affirmative and combalet de carignan finding that his friend's acquaintance with me turned out advantageously would fain have proved himself an old friend of mine also jacques mocqueur however cut him short exclaiming no no you were not of the party and you just as much remember monsieur's face as i do the high priest of the jews why i have done so many sweet youths lately replied the other and broken so many heads that i grow a strange confounder of faces ay if you had been with us that day answered jacques mocqueur you would have had your own head broken why monsieur made short work with us he pitched captain von crack out of the window like an empty oyster-shell and pricked me a hole in my shoulder before either of us knew on what ground we were standing and he made me a low bow to send his compliment home up to the hilt to proceed to business said i after i had invited my companions to taste the contents of the flagons which they did with truly generous rivalry let me hear what wages you two gentlemen require for entering into my service that depends upon two things replied combalet de carignan what sort of service your lordship demands and what power you have to protect us in executing it simple brawling for you cheating pimping lying swearing thrashing or being thrashed fighting on your part steel to steel and any other thing in the way of reason we are ready to undertake but murder assassination and highway robbery are out of our way of business i have been employed in the service of the state am come of a good family am well born and well educated and would rather starve than do anything mean or dishonourable nothing of the kind shall be demanded of you replied i and the worst you shall risk in my service shall be hard blows that is nothing replied jacques moqueur combalet does not fear even a little hanging but he dreads having a hotter place in the other world than his friends and companions but for general service such as your lordship demands we cannot have less than sixty crowns a month each to this i made no opposition and a written agreement was drawn out between us in the following authentic form we combalet de carignan and jacques de Moqueur, hereby take service with monsieur le comte de l'orme promising to serve him faithfully in all his commands provided they not be such as may put us in danger of the great carving-knife the road to heaven or the round bedstead we declare his enemies our enemies and his friends our friends all for the consideration of sixty crowns per month to be paid to each of us by the said count de l'orme together with his aid and protection in all cases of danger and difficulty as well as food and maintenance in health and surgical assistance in case of our becoming either sick or wounded in his service in addition to the above i stipulated that my two new retainers were to abandon all other business than mine and though they might lie as much as they pleased to any one else that they should uniformly tell me the truth at this last proposal jacques moqueur burst into a fit of laughter and combalet de carignan hesitated and stammered most desperately you must know monsieur said he at length that my friend jacques and i have established a high character amongst our brethren by never promising anything without performing it now everything we say we will do for your lordship be sure that it shall be done even to our own detriment but as to telling you the truth i can't undertake it i never told the truth in my life except in regard to promises and i own i should not know how to begin it is my infirmity lying and i cannot get over it jacques moqueur can tell you the truth oh i have known him tell the truth very often but really monsieur you must excuse me well then monsieur combalet said i your friend jacques shall tell me the truth and when you lie to me he shall correct you and i will set it down to your infirmity 
"'Agreed, monsieur, agreed,' replied the other. "'I am quite willing that you should know the truth. "'I do not lie to deceive. "'It proceeds solely for an exuberant and poetical imagination. "'But allow me to request one thing, which is that you would call me de Carignan. "'I am somewhat tenacious in regard to my family, "'for you must know that I am descended from the illustrious house of Carignan of... "'The infirmity, the infirmity!' exclaimed Jacques Moncoeur. His mother was a lady of pleasure in the Rue des Hurleurs, and his father was a footman. The bravo turned with a furious air upon his companion, but Jacques Mocqueur only laughed and assured me that what he said was true. All preliminaries were now definitely settled, and giving the archer another piece of gold, I hinted to him that he might leave me alone with my new attendants. This was no sooner done then i proceeded to my more immediate object you think doubtless my men said i that i am about to employ you as you have hitherto been employed in any of those little services which require men devoid of prejudice and not overburdened with morality but you are mistaken in the enterprise for which i destine you you will stand side by side with the best and noblest of the land if we fail we will all lay our bones together if we succeed your reward is sure and a nobler career is open to you than that which you have hitherto followed my two recruits looked at each other in some surprise he means buccaneering said combalet to his companion fie no replied jacques moncoeur after a moment's thought he means a conspiracy because he talks about it being a nobler career folks always call their conspiracies noble though lawyers call it treason however monsieur if it is anything against our late lord and master his most devilish eminence of richelieu we are your men for we both owe him a deep grudge and we make it a point of honour to pay our debts but who are we to fight for and who against hold hold my friend replied i you are running forward somewhat too fast remember that you are speaking to your lord whom you have bound yourself to serve and you must obey his commands without inquiring why or wherefore. Ay, answered Combalet, so long as they do not make us put our heads under the great carving knife. But when your lordship talks about conspiracies... Who talks about conspiracies, knave? cried I, finding that my horses were showing signs of restiveness. Who talks of conspiracies? You have nothing to do but receive my commands, and when I propose anything to you that brings you within the danger of the law then make your objection but to the point proceeded i i am told and indeed know from the best authority that all the persons exercising your honourable profession in any of its branches form as it were a sort of club or society which is governed by its own laws to a certain degree and i am moreover informed that you have a certain place of meeting where the elders of your body assemble called swash castle or chateau escroc where you have a chief magistrate named king of the huns is not this the fact i had gained my information from various sources but greatly from my little attendant achilles who had an especial talent for finding out things concealed my knowledge of their secrets however had a great effect upon my two attendants who began to think i believe that either as a professor or an amateur I had at some former time exercised their honourable trade myself. "'There is no denying it, sir,' replied Jacques Moncoeur at length. "'We are a regular corporation. So much I may say, for you know it already. But ask me no farther, for we are bound by something tighter than an oath, not to reveal the mysteries of our craft.' "'I am going to ask you no question,' replied I firmly but I am going to command you to take me to your rendezvous, or Swash Castle, and introduce me to your worthy prince, the King of the Huns. My two respectable followers gazed in each other's eyes with so much wonder and amazement that I saw I had made a very unusual request, but I was resolved to carry my point, and accordingly added, after waiting a few moments for an answer, Why don't you reply? do not waste your time in staring one at the other for i am determined to go and nothing shall prevent me samson was a strong man monsieur replied jacques shaking his head but he could not drink out of an empty pitcher your lordship would find it a difficult matter to accomplish your object by yourself 
and though here we stand willing according to our agreement to serve you to the best of our power yet i do not believe that we can do what you require mark me master jacques mock replied i my determination is taken i came to paris for the express purpose of treating with your king of the huns on matters of deep importance and back i will not go without having fulfilled my mission if therefore you and your companion can gain me admittance into your chateau d'escroc by to-morrow night ten pieces of gold each shall be your reward if not i must find other means for my purpose and take care that you put no trick upon me for be sure that i will find a time to break every bone in your skin if you do you know i am a man to keep my word i do i do monsieur replied jacques Mocqueur. it cost me a yard and a half of diachelon the last bout i had with you and i would not wish to try it again all i can say is that we will do our best to gain a royal ordinance for your lordship's admittance but if you really have made up your mind to go knowing anything of what you undertake you must have a stout heart of your own that is all that i can say i have only farther to assure your lordship that the more information you can give us of your purpose the more likely we are to succeed you may tell his majesty of the huns replied i that i come to him as an ambassador from one prince to treat with another that he may find his own advantage in seeing me for that i shall be contented to cast ten golden pieces into his royal treasury as an earnest of future offerings on my first visit and that he need not be in the least fear as i come unattended and quite willing to submit to any precautions he may judge necessary after a little reflection my two attendants did not seem to think my enterprise quite so impracticable as they had at first imagined they banded the pros and cons however some time between them in a jargon which to me was very nearly unintelligible and at last once more assuring me that they would do their best they left me after having received a piece or two to stimulate their exertions before i let them depart i also took care to enforce the necessity of dispatch and insisted upon it that a definitive answer should be given me by dusk the day after as soon as messieurs combelet de carignan and jacques moncoeur were gone my own steps were turned towards the hotel de soissons and revolving in my own mind the events of the day i walked on like most young diplomatists perfectly self-satisfied with the first steps of my negotiation even before it showed the least probability of ultimate success End of chapter 43